Now, a high-protein diet is commonly defined as a diet in which more than 20% of calories are originating as protein in food. So first, let's talk about how this affects your body composition. The studies are very clear that a high-protein diet leads to improved body composition, which is lower body weight and potentially more skeletal muscle mass, okay? Especially when it comes in, in tandem with resistance exercise. Now, this happens because when you perform resistance exercise, the muscles that are used during that workout are, are very hungry for glucose and amino acids and fatty acids after the workout is over because those building blocks, the glucose, the amino acids, and the fatty acids are used to help repair muscle tissue and help restore fuel inside of the muscle that has been depleted during the actual workout. So you can think of amino acids as being the structural repair uh, substrate or the structural repair material and the glucose and the fatty acids as being the fuel, which can go back into the muscle to help it perform the next time. Combined with the fact that exercise makes it much easier to maintain a calorie deficit, studies have actually demonstrated that a high protein diet combined with resistance exercise has a lot of promise when it comes to specifically reversing obesity and helping to promote weight loss. And that's a very good thing. Now, Diets like the Atkins diet, the carnivore diet, and the ever popular ketogenic diet are all about restricting your carbohydrate intake, as you've heard us say, ad nauseum. Okay. And the, the, one of the benefits of these types of carbohydrate restriction diets is that they promote rapid weight loss, especially at the very beginning of the process. And that weight loss by itself improves glycemic control independent of any other lifestyle changes. So you can see how people that eat a very low carbohydrate diet end up actually losing weight more than people who are eating a low fat diet and they lose weight faster. And that one reason right there is one of the reasons why people who eat a low carb diet often see that their blood glucose goes down and their A1C goes down because they're losing weight. And since weight loss is directly correlated with an increase in insulin sensitivity, high protein diets and low carbohydrate diets both yield some very powerful immediate positive results as long as the weight loss process is underway. However, despite the fact that the high protein and lots of exercise may be a quick and effective weight loss tool, the research shows that eating a protein, a diet that's high in protein can actually become very problematic over the course of time. Now, here's why. At the start, high-protein diets, if coupled with exercise, help reduce insulin resistance thanks to changes in your body composition, including less body fat and increased muscle mass. However, the research shows that over time, high-protein diets by themselves do not have a meaningful impact on insulin sensitivity. In fact, they actually increase insulin resistance, and I want you to know that. Wait, 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 Cyrus, stop, 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 stop. Did you just say that a high protein diet increases insulin resistance? Yes. And I said it and I will say it once again. Eating a high protein diet may suppress your blood glucose in the three hours following a meal and help promote weight loss in the short term. But high protein diets cause delayed blood glucose rises starting about three hours after you eat a meal and they increase your baseline level of insulin resistance in the long term. It is very important that you understand this because the short-term results are promising. The long-term results are daunting. Hey, I'm Cyrus Kambata, co-creator of the Mastering Diabetes Method, which has helped thousands of people reverse insulin resistance and take control of their lives no matter what type of diabetes they're living with. Do you want to know all of our tips, tricks, and secrets? They're right here in our New York Times bestselling book, Mastering Diabetes, which you can find at masteringdiabetes.org slash book. If you're ready to master diabetes, pick up a copy today. You won't be disappointed. A recent study investigated the effect of losing 10% body mass by eating a calorie-restricted diet containing either 0.8 grams per kilogram protein or 1.2 grams per kilogram protein of specifically animal. Now, if you don't understand what this 0 0.8 and 1.2 means, it's very simple. You take your body weight in kilograms 
and you multiply that either times 0.8 grams or by 1.2 grams to determine how much protein you would be eating on a daily basis. So effectively, what this research team is, is trying to tease out is when you're eating a low amount of protein at 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight versus what they consider to be a high amount of protein intake at 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight, they're trying to determine what is the difference in muscle mass preservation as well as insulin sensitivity. Now, even though the high protein diet preserved muscle mass by 45%, it prevented the weight loss improvements in muscle insulin signaling. So you can see on your screen right now that people who consumed the high protein diet actually preserved more muscle mass. And you would think that that's a good thing because the higher your protein intake, the more muscle mass you preserve, the better you look, the better you feel, the more likely you are to eat that high protein diet. However, if you take a look at what happened to their insulin sensitivity, what you'll find is that only the subjects who ate the low protein diet increased insulin sensitivity, but the subjects who ate the high protein diet did not. And this is very important because again, weight loss is supposed to stimulate increased insulin sensitivity. It is a normal biochemical response to weight loss. And that's one of the benefits of losing weight in particular. So if you're losing weight, but you're not gaining insulin sensitivity, then you're doing something that's actually impeding the weight loss process. And you're doing something that's actually likely not, that goes against your biochemical design. Now, in addition to these modest changes in insulin signaling that occur during weight loss, Studies are also demonstrating that diets that are high in protein cause what's referred to as late onset postprandial hyperglycemia and late onset postprandial hyperinsulinemia starting approximately three hours after eating a single meal. What the heck does this mean? These are big words. What this means is that these research studies are identifying that when you eat a meal, the first three hours of glucose and insulin dynamics are totally normal. Starting at the three hour marker, people who eat high protein diets end up with higher blood glucose and higher insulin requirements, and that can last up to 12 to 18 hours. Now, this is very important because people who are living with type one diabetes in particular, like myself, like Robbie, and like many people who have gone through our program are excellent test subjects because you can control 100% of our insulin requirements using outside or exogenous insulin. And when you perform experiments on people with type 1 diabetes, you see that a high protein meal, one single meal, has a profound effect on how much insulin you need in order to control your blood glucose. Now, there was a study performed by Wolpert et al., and they demonstrated that subjects with type 1 diabetes who were fed a high fat dinner containing 60 grams of fat required significantly more insulin over the subsequent 18 hours then did subjects who were fed a low fat dinner containing only 10 grams of fat. So again, a higher fat intake delays glucose absorption and minimizes improvements in insulin sensitivity, actually causing insulin resistance. The high fat dinner actually caused more hyperglycemia or higher blood glucose values than a low fat dinner, despite increased insulin administration. So as you can see on the screen, the paper that I'm talking about is demonstrated here. If you take a look at the way that this study was designed, you'll see that in order to come to this conclusion, the researchers performed what's called a crossover design where subjects were, were put into both tracks. Track number one is where they were fed a high fat dinner and then monitored for the next 18 hours. And then they were fed a low fat dinner and monitored for another 18 hours. Track number two, is where they were first fed the low fat dinner and then monitored for 18 hours, followed by a high fat dinner and monitored for another 18 hours. So in essence, the two tracks either went high fat, low fat, or low fat, high fat. And by doing this, you can, you can put subjects through both tracks and figure out how their blood glucose control differs depending on whether they're in track one or track two. And what you'll find is that when subjects were fed a high fat dinner, the dinner that contained 60 grams of fat required a significantly larger amount of insulin over the subsequent 18 hours than did the subjects who were fed a low fat dinner that contained only 10 grams of fat. And in addition, 
that the increased insulin that these subjects were given still was not enough to prevent high blood glucose. So they tried to give these subjects more insulin to control their blood glucose, but they didn't do a good enough job. So if they were to repeat the experiment, they would have to give them even more insulin to control their blood glucose even more. Long story short, you eat a high protein meal, a single meal that increases your blood glucose values over the course of the next 18 hours, and it increases your insulin requirements significantly. Both of those are counterproductive. Now there's another study by Patterson et al. And they demonstrated that the addition of 30 grams of fat to a meal that already contains 30 grams of carbohydrate increased the post-meal glycemic excursions by 1.8 millimolar in the subsequent five hours in patients living with type 1 diabetes. Now, 1.8 millimolar is approximately 35 nanograms per millimeter in our imperial units, okay? And similarly, they found that the addition of 40 grams of protein to a 30 gram carbohydrate meal increased postprandial glycemia by 2.4 millimolar, right? Which is approximately 45 points. So if you add 40 grams of protein to a meal that contains 30 grams of carbohydrate, you can expect that your blood glucose will increase by approximately 45 points. Now they extended this finding even once more. And they said, if we were to take 30 grams of fat and 40 grams of protein together and combine it with 30 grams of carbohydrate, what's going to happen? And they found that when they did this, subjects' blood glucose went up even more. And when they did the math and tried to figure out how much came from protein and how much came from, from fat, what they determined is that the, the effects of fat and protein are additive. That means that if you eat fat, it'll raise your blood glucose values. If you eat protein, it'll raise your blood glucose values. So therefore, if you eat the two of them together, it'll raise your blood glucose values uh, twice as much because there's a contribution that comes from fat and a contribution that comes from protein, and both of them work to increase your blood glucose. Now, studies that investigate the postprandial or the post-meal glycemic responses to these meals containing anywhere from about 30 grams, 28 to 57 grams, so call it 30 to 60 grams of added protein, have demonstrated time after time and after time significantly increased glycemic excursions, meaning worse blood glucose control and higher insulin requirements between two and five hours after the meal is over. And this is where I wanna pause for a second because it's very important to understand. On social media, people say, look, I ate this papaya or I ate this banana and my blood glucose went up. Now I added chicken to the meal and now I'm eating chicken and papaya or I'm eating chicken and banana. That sounds like a terrible meal, but you get my point. They're adding some type of meat or some type of protein or some type of fat rich food and they're doing it so that they can suppress their blood glucose. And then they monitor over the course of the next two to three hours and they go, look, my blood glucose control is so much better. All of a sudden I flattened out my blood glucose response and that's a good thing. But what they don't realize is that what the research shows is that sure, in the first two to three hours, that's totally expected. But what matters is what happens starting at the three-hour marker. If they were to follow their blood glucose from the three-hour marker into the future, what they're likely to find is that their insulin requirements for the next 12 to 15 hours are actually higher. And they may not be recognizing that because again, they're wearing their short-term goggles and they're not wearing their long-term goggles. Now in subjects with type one diabetes in particular, eating more than 75 grams of protein in one meal can delay these postprandial or these post-meal glycemic, you know, high blood glucose values um, between three and five hours. So what that means, again, is that if you're eating 75 grams of protein in one given meal, which quite honestly is a lot of protein, then you're asking for higher blood glucose. Again, not initially, but starting at between the three and five hour mark, okay? So this is very important to understand, extremely important that you understand that these studies suggest that in subjects who are living with type 1 diabetes, adding between 28 and 75 grams of protein causes your blood glucose to go up, not initially, but starting at approximately the three-hour marker or the five-hour marker, depending on how much protein you consume, and that can last for as much as 18 hours. If you know this, you can equip yourself for success by lowering your protein intake at any given meal. But if you're wearing your short-term goggles and you're only paying attention to the first two to three hours, you're going to get misled every single time. Hey, hey. 
This video was just a snippet of a much more in-depth discussion. Now we know not everyone has the time to watch an hour long video. So I hope that this highlight taught you something helpful. Now, if you're interested in watching the full length deep dive, then I highly recommend that you check it out because there's a ton more to learn on the subject. And this is just hitting the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Just click on the link on the screen to check out the full length episode. And if you're already going, whoa, 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 that's a lot to digest. I just want to live a healthy life and call it a day. Then don't worry because we have expert coaches who can help get you true long lasting health that can actually be very simple and be your accountability coach and give you a personalized roadmap to lower your blood sugar, to lose weight and to get off medication for good. Now the science behind health is overly complicated, unfortunately, but getting healthy doesn't have to be. Visit masteringdiabetes.org slash start. Answer some questions about yourself and schedule a free consultation to talk with somebody on our team who's going to show you exactly how we've transformed the lives of thousands of people using the Mastering Diabetes Method. It's important you answer all of the questions to the best of your ability because we want to be able to get you the right coach. We have a limited number of spots available, and that's why it's imperative to find a good fit. Again, visit masteringdiabetes.org slash start to schedule a free zero commitment discovery call and start taking control of your health today.